Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. We had such an amazing guest. I just finished recording Stephen Pear, the founder and CEO of BitPay. BitPay is the oldest and longest running Bitcoin company. I think they launched in like 2011, around the same time that I got into the scene. Stephen Pear, who is the founder, he didn't just he wasn't just a kid in his in his parents' basement like I was. He was a senior software engineer and would be a top executive at IBM today had he not left to found BitPay. And this was a time when his bosses were telling him to sell your Bitcoin before the government shuts it down. These were some really, really crazy days. And we talked about some of the most amazing stories about how when Barry Silbert called up Stephen and said, is this the end of Bitcoin? We discussed some questions that we always have, like, is it better just to buy Bitcoin rather than invest in mining? Ten years later, we're still seeking that clarity. And we talked about some really cool things like how Satoshi didn't introduce anything new. Instead, he relied on trusted and proven techniques that have been around for so long, like PGP, SHA-256. Satoshi wasn't reinventing the wheel. Rather, he was bringing all these such amazing technologies together. And that was the most amazing invention that Satoshi did. So enjoy the story. Enjoy the episode. Have a great day. And coming up right after the ads. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. US customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com. Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott was my first sponsor for Untold Stories and really called me up and said, Charlie, I love what you're doing. I really want to sponsor your show and further the education. Scott Offord is the super czar of crypto mining. He's a broker of ASIC Mining Gear, helps people buy and sell their miners. So if you want to buy mining tools, if you want to buy miners, if you have any questions on how it works, if you want to sell your miners or even just broker them, Scott is the guy to call. Not only that, but he created a free Bitcoin mining profitability calculator at CryptoMining.Tools. That's the website. And it also has an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart. What that means is he has all these different fields where you could enter data like, you know, the cost of your miners, the cost of your electricity, and it takes into it takes in things into comparison like the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having, and it gives you things like what are your how many days until your return on investment? Is it even profitable for you to be mining? All these other type of information, which products to get. It's your one-stop shop for learning how to actually mine for Bitcoin or any of the other altcoins that have mining built in. Give Scott a call, send him a message. You can follow him on Telegram and at Twitter at Offered Scott. That's O F F O R D S C O T T. Of course, the links are in the show notes. Untold Stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. 
few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the Blockworks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. I don't even know where to start this episode. Steven, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Charlie. I, I don't, well, because I was, you know, I, I was walking my dog this morning and I was saying, you know, how do I, I always think about how do I introduce the show? What do I talk about? How do I introduce the guests? You have not, you and I have known each other since at least 2012, 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, you are just to give the listeners tell you, cause they're like, who's Steven guys, Steven pair is the founder and CEO of BitPay. You've all, you all know the company. I, I think I could say this BitPay is the oldest and longest running um, crypto company out there. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I, I believe we are. I mean, um, I was just going over some stats uh, about the company because we've worked together. Um, I know you for so long. And I have to say that I was reading a stat and it said that in 2012, you had 1,100 active merchants. Mm-hmm. Is that that's is that accurate? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, if, if you came across that stat, that's... Um, yeah, yeah. I, th- I, I mean, we had uh, probably 1,100 accounts that were created at that yeah. time. Yeah. That's in, that's I mean, even hey, even 11 accounts in 2012 <laughs> right. is amazing because, as you know, um, and I and I and I think it seems accurate. And I actually at, at my nightclub EVR, mm-hmm. I was one of your accounts, too. We were yeah. the first bar to accept Bitcoin and we did it. We did it using BitPay and people would come in and buy like thousands of dollars worth of champagne and they'd you'd. They'd use um they'd use Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And so I want to get into the into the founding of the company and more of the why. But um there's a question that I never asked you. Mm-hmm. Um you graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology, Computer Science. You were um a senior software engineer at IBM, and then you went to found a, a Bitcoin company in 2011 when Bitcoin wasn't even a thing. There yeah. was it wasn't even tri- not I mean, why give up this? this amazing career where you could be the who knows like a CEO of IBM today to start this company with with one of your buddies Tony from from college well uh that story goes back to uh the early 1990s you know shortly after college I got very fascinated with digicash and uh just really uh I don't know there was something about the idea of taking money and doing it completely digitally that uh was I don't know. It was one of those as a computer scientist, it was one of those things that, you know, just kind of grabbed my attention. And uh, I was a big fan of PGP as well and and cryptography in the day and sort of was following Phil Zimmerman and that whole saga. Um, But I I became a big fan of Digicash. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know, Digicash was probably the world's first cryptographic payment system. And uh, they... Uh, while it was a cryptographic payment system, it was centralized. And so when Digicash went bankrupt, uh, that payment system went away with it. And, you know, that got a lot of a lot of people thinking about how do you create a true Internet protocol for payments? And through the late 90s and early 2000s, I just, you know, as a kind of hobby or sideline, side I uh, uh, was just looking for projects that were making progress on that uh, that problem. Um, and I got to say, you know, by the time Bitcoin came out, I'd almost given up on on uh, on seeing anything like that happen. And I think most people did. That's why yeah. on the mailing list, it was so um, people were so pessimistic or jaded mm-hmm. and didn't believe really Satoshi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, so I was looking for projects, you know, there were things like Second Life Linden dollars that were not really interesting from a computer science perspective, but we're getting some, uh, you know, adoption. Um, and then there was something called Ripple and not the Ripple that we know today. Uh, I played around with that for a little bit. But then in late 2010, the, uh, you know, I uh, finally got around to reading the Satoshi white paper. I actually heard about Bitcoin uh, shortly after it was launched. I think it was on Slashdot and uh, kind of dismissed it at the time. Um, 
And then I finally studied the the white paper, the Satoshi white paper, and realized what mining was all about and how this all kind of worked. And I was very fortunate that I had the had thought about this problem uh, a long time, and uh, you know saw potential. I didn't I, I didn't say yeah this is going to take over the world or anything, but I, I uh, saw enough potential there, and I was also at the time ready to get back into a startup environment. So while I was at IBM, I was there through a couple acquisitions. Uh, started with a small company that got acquired by a bigger company that then got acquired by IBM. And, uh, you know, I just really wanted to get back into a startup environment. Uh, that's where I had the most fun in my career. And so I had been looking for ideas for business for a while. Um, none of none of those ideas were compelling enough for me to, to leave IBM uh, until... Uh, until I read that Satoshi white paper, um, even before BitPay, I started thinking about uh, or playing around with a couple of different business ideas around uh, around Bitcoin. Um, but then I got to started talking to Tony, and uh, you know, just he and I going back and forth on it over over the period of a couple months, we we uh, uh, decided to launch BitPay, and that was in. Uh, that was around May of 2011, and then we started writing the code for BitPay, and wow. we we launched. Uh, the first version of BitPay uh, right after the Fourth of July in 2011. You're you're going to hit your centennial in a year from now. Yeah, exactly. how does that feel? <laughs> uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, yeah, you have to. Any stop company it. hitting their 10 year anniversary is amazing, but like a a yeah. Bitcoin company hitting their 10 year anniversary, it's like yeah, it's like getting million mile status on an airline. You know, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely have to have have an event of, of some kind, maybe another Bitcoin bowl. <laughs> that would be amazing, and. The last, um, the last one you sponsored, you sponsored the St. Pete Bitcoin Bowl. I had, mm-hmm. I was living in Pennsylvania. I didn't even know anything about this region, and now I live like an hour south of St. Pete, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's great. So when you were reading the the Bitcoin white paper, and the way you read it and the way I read it were two different, mm-hmm. you know, kind of from two different eyes. The way I read it um, was like. Um, I had no really, I didn't never thought about money. I was studying economics, but I didn't really think about like digital money or I didn't really know about any of the footnotes, right? Like, so mm-hmm. Satoshi had cited a bunch of other projects, um, Digicash, like you mentioned, PGP, uh, Hashcash, uh, B Money, all the ones I named. So, someone like you reading the white paper, and tell me if, tell me if this is true. I feel like you were reading it, and this is what other people have told me. I feel like you're reading it and saying to yourself, Satoshi, figured out a way to combine all of the things that worked of all the other uh, digital monies that, that, that didn't work kind of combine them all together and then take PGP and then have this ability to do um, literally a chain of blocks, the blockchain concept. And so the Bitcoin is really a culmination, if you will, of all these other failed projects. Yeah, I would say that's, uh, that's, that's true. Um, the overarching thing for me, though, was he, he had solved this decentralized, uh, um, you know, issuance problem or, or solved this problem of how do you create a payment network that doesn't require a centralized company, uh, you know, a third party to process all the transactions. And uh, that was the overarching, you know, sort of thing for me that, that was that was the big problem that a lot of computer scientists couldn't really figure out, and here it was just kind of laid out in a few pages. And the simplicity of that white paper, um, you know, oftentimes the best solutions in computer scientists in computer science are, are the simplest ones. And you know, here you can read this, and if you'd thought about this problem, it was it was almost by the time you were done it's reading like the, it, it was almost the obvious. It problem? was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was almost so obvious that you, you, you have to stop and think this, this can't, it can't possibly be this simple. Right. And, but yet it was. And, uh, and what then, was it, it that was so simple? Well, the whole thing. I mean, the fact that, you know, in what is it, 10 pages in that white paper? Yeah. The whole white started. paper is like nine or 10 pages. It's insane. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it worked and, and, and by the time I read it, it was already working. So you could go look at the blockchain and you could observe that it was in fact working and, uh, and then the, one of the first things that I did was I, I started uh, not refactoring the code base, but the uh, Satoshi, um, I, I, I don't think was a professional computer science or uh, software developer because uh, the way he organized the source code was very atypical of a, of a C++ project. And so one of the first things I did was like re, rewrite or reorganize the entire code base 
um, uh, and it's funny, I did that and I, I, I didn't change any of the behavior. I just wanted to clean it up and make it more approachable to a typical C++ developer. And, uh, kind of presented that to the community and, and Jeff Garzik ironically shot me down. He's like, we're not doing that. You know, it was like too big of a change, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I was very careful not to change any of the actual behavior and just kind of clean up and, and reorganize, uh, like a lot of the code was up in the header files. And if you know anything about C++, uh, uh, development, that's, um, it's kind of not, uh, not ideal. Um, so anyway, I mean, I wasn't going to ask who you think Satoshi is because it's kind of a stupid question and I won't, but just to give some insight into, um, into what you just said, cause that really, that, that's interesting. Um, I had never really heard that before. So a lot of people claim that Satoshi is this brilliant computer scientist, not saying that he's not, but, um, then how do you think he came up with, with this whole, if he's, if what you said is true, um, well, of course it's true, but, how do you think he even came up with this whole concept of Bitcoin or was it more of a group of people? And then they just tasked this one person with writing the actual Satoshi code. I mean, it could have been a group of people. It could have been an individual. I think there are probably thousands of computer scientists on the planet that could have built Bitcoin and probably would have had Satoshi not done it. Um, it, it was a matter of time until, and, until somebody did it. And, uh, it's just if you also also one interesting thing about Bitcoin was it didn't it didn't do anything that wasn't it didn't incorporate any technologies that weren't already proven. So it used SHA-256. SHA it used, uh, you know, a lot of um, known proven algorithms and, and mathematics and, and didn't try to invent something new that that was untested. So um, he wasn't reinventing the wheel. Right. But he was able to bring all these different technologies together mm -hmm. and solve, you know, this, this Byzantine generals problem of mm -hmm. how do you not trust anyone, but have this trusted system. Mm -hmm. um, and I literally, when I get up on stage, I, I, I draw, I take a whiteboard and I draw in markers, the little walled city and I draw generals around the, the, the city. And I try to explain to people what the Byzantine generals problem actually is mm -hmm. and why it's so important that it was solved here. Yeah. So you, um, so you found out about Bitcoin and you were, you were friends with Tony and, and, and chatting. And then, so you said to yourself that I want to eventually start, um, start something in the space. Was it going to be a company company or did you say, I'm just going to start like a side hustle or do something well, for fun? I, I mean, I started my, no, I, I wanted to, it to be a, a company company. I'd been at IBM, I guess, six or seven years, um, and actually on the same product through, three different companies owning that product. And, uh, you know, I was ready for, like I said earlier, I was ready to get back into a startup environment, ready to do something different and had been trying to, f you know, think of different business ideas or, you know, startup ideas. Um, and then, uh, read the white paper, got, you know, was captivated, uh, by it and felt like I wanted to do something around, uh, around Bitcoin. And I saw the potential there. So right away I started mining. I was like, you know, going and buying up all the graphics cards around Atlanta and, and, uh, um, had set up a whole mining rig in my basement and kind of did this after hours after my wife went to sleep. And, uh, I didn't want her to think I was crazy, you know? So, uh, and in fact, I brought, I think all our wives think yeah. we're crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did. Well, maybe she thinks I'm crazy. I just didn't want to scare her. Right. And uh, yeah. so I was, I was building this equipment and this mining stuff in, in the basement. And it was funny. One, one time she came down there and she was like, why is it so hot down here? <laughs> 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 um, you know, but uh, yeah. And then, you know, I, I eventually, you know, uh, let her in on it and, and showed, talked about what I was doing and, and uh, brought some other friends over and showed them what I was doing. I think I got a lot of looks uh, of people that I think did think I was crazy. Um, well, because you were investing real money into this thing. Yeah, it's not absolutely. like you were talking about it for fun. You were like mm -hmm. buying graphics cards. It wasn't cheap. Right. So people are kind of looking at you like you're crazy. Like, why right. is he spending money on this weird computer code thing? Yeah, no, I had a whole rack in the basement with, uh, you know, stacked with uh, computers. I uh, had duct work I was running to try and get the hot air out of the basement. I had air conditioning <laughs> oh. systems and yeah, it was fun though. I, I for, it was the first time in my life that I ever, when a when a computer broke down and I had to pull it out of the rack and repair it, I felt this sense of urgency to get it back into service and, and mining again. It was kind of kind of because you're uptime. Yeah, exactly. You know, it was uh, it was earning money, right? 
Um, you were probably a significant part of the the Bitcoin network back then. Uh, I mean, I was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, not. I wasn't as big as like Art Fours or some of those those people, but uh, you know, it was. Uh, it was fun. And, but in hindsight, I would have been better off just taking the money I invested in that mining hardware and just buying Bitcoin with it. But uh, you think that's you think that's true over the course of time with mining? Do you think it's it's whenever you say, all right, I want to start mining or at any point in time of Bitcoin's history, mm-hmm. even when the price was five cents or thousand mm-hmm. dollars, do you think that's true with mining that at any time that you want to go mining? You could just instead use that money to buy Bitcoin and hold it. Well, it can't be true for everybody. Otherwise, we would have no miners, right? <laughs> so That's what I'm getting at. What incentivizes yeah. the miners then as a business? Why would they want to do it? Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I think in, in mining, you were always, it seemed to me you were always best when the price was rising, but not rising too quickly. And, uh, you know, today it's a, it's a commodity business and you have to really... Um, put big spreadsheets together and think about the cost of electricity, think about, uh, you know, capital equipment costs. And uh, you probably also need to have a, a good way to source the the equipment needed, needed to mine. And it's a scale business. So, um, you know, it's uh, not, not really um, something you can just get into uh, like you used to and just expect to be profitable and, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Is that true over the course of history? You're better off just buying Bitcoin? Um, maybe, but that's, uh, but buying Bitcoin is taking exposure uh, to a, 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 you know, a volatile asset. It's an investment in Bitcoin. In fact, what I, I used to do is I, I thought about the mining business and the investment business separately. So as soon as, you know, I mined a Bitcoin, uh, the, those would get sold to the investment business. So I could, you know, clearly think about the profitability of the uh, oh, the mining Smart. business separate from the investing in Bitcoin business. Um, Most miners I meet are like diehard Bitcoin. They're not people who, and it's it's changed. It's not a hundred percent anymore. But even even today, I'll meet a, a someone who's invested a significant amount of money in mining, mm-hmm. and they are someone who who has enough money to carry the operating costs of the operation Mm -hmm. without having to sell the Bitcoin because they believe that in a year or two, three years from now, the Bitcoin that they're earning will be worth significantly more. Yeah. So for those people, why not, why wouldn't you just buy Bitcoin instead of mining, right? Because it's a tax write off. So that's what they explained to me. Essentially when you're, when you're, when you're spending money on operation, it's a, it's an operation that's just constantly losing money. Mm -hmm. And if you're someone who owes a lot of money in taxes, you start a business that, basically is constantly losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. You get to write off your all your past taxes on it. And then uh, once you sell your Bitcoin, it's when you can actually pay taxes on the Bitcoin that you sold. Mm-hmm. Well, and I it kind of makes sense. Well, yeah, except that at some point, if you are if you run a business at a loss for long enough, the IRS tells you that's not a business, that's a hobby. <laughs> that's a good point. Right. Yeah. And someone else told me that too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why clarity is is – still being seeked you know let's just call it 10 years later even though we're like at nine years or whatever Mm -hmm. 10 years later we're still seeking clarity but i mean tell me about like some of the meetings that you had with with regulators or with banks um was it hard for you to get a bank account at BitPay early on i mean that's what your your business is is it's a bridge for people to go in and out of the, the crypto space especially merchants um i still use your the BitPay visa card i used it last night actually Mm -hmm. um um, so was it hard dealing with regulators and with banks early on? Um, I don't know if hard is the right word. It's, it's a, it's a <laughs> process. It's, it, it certainly, we spend a lot of time on it and a lot of that time is just education. Uh, they want to, uh, understand and, and, and learn how to think about all of this. And, and so, yeah, I mean, we've talked to regulators in all the States and, uh, internationally, uh, at the federal level, um, so, uh, I, I, getting bank accounts, um, there are banks out there that are, are perfectly willing to now there lean, are. lean forward. Well, even back then, I mean, they, they, um, if, if you had your ducks in a row and, um, were could demonstrate that you're, you know, a, a serious, you're thinking about this seriously and incredibly, and you're, you're taking the regulations seriously, um, then, um, and, and doing what you needed to do, then, um, I, you know, I, I won't say it was easy to get bank accounts, but it was doable. And, um, 
you know, even to this day, you know, you, you'll have banks that some banks want to lean forward and, and want to be involved in the space. And then other banks are, uh, think they want to at one moment in time and then change their mind and uh, decide they, they, they don't want this, this type of business. So eToro is crypto trading made easy. It's one of the largest and smartest trading platforms in the world with extraordinarily low and transparent fees. Join myself and 11 million other traders and create an account at eToro.com. Links in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. As a mining equipment broker, Scott Offered wants to make sure his clients are well-informed and making data-backed business decisions. Scott created the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI for miners. It's a better way to compare the efficiency of various models of ASIC miners and to see how the price of the miner and the efficiency impacts your mining profitability. So check it out at CryptoMining.Tools and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O F F O R D. S-C-O-T-T. So tell me more about the founding of the company, how you guys grew so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what type of staff were you having to hire first? What kind of hurdles did you have to go through? Because you weren't just um, growing your startup. You were paving, trailblazing this industry at the same time. You were having to basically invent things, yeah. um, invent roles probably, right? Yeah. So Tony and I started talking. So I, I brought Tony in and, or didn't bring him in, but I told him about Bitcoin probably in like February of 2011 or something. And uh, he and I at the time had reconnected over Facebook. You know, we had fallen out of touch over the years since college. And uh, and this is in the aftermath of 2008. And uh, uh, and. And so he and I were at the time doing a bit of options trading. I was doing it more as a hobby and just, just for fun. And, uh, so we would talk a lot about that. And, and, and then I told him about this thing called Bitcoin and he actually had a similar reaction at first that I did, which, you know, he kind of dismissed it. And it, I think his first reaction was to tell me that I should sell my Bitcoin before the government shuts it down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, he was dismissive of it at first. And then after I kept talking to him about it and he, he started thinking more about it, 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 it started to sound more and more, uh, appealing and like there's opportunity. Uh, and, and so we started talking about businesses we could start around it. We early on, and probably one of the things I, I, I would change is that we decided that the, uh, the exchange business was already a crowded space and likely to become commoditized very soon. And this is, you know, you're talking 2011 here. And there, even in 2011, you had Mt. Gox and Trade Hill was starting to, to start up. And, and, uh, and so it seemed like there are already a lot of exchanges. Um, even in Atlanta, there was a, an exchange called Camp BX. So we felt like that was going to be a crowded They were place. based in Atlanta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember Camp BX, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, uh, so, so we felt like that was crowded. And uh, we also felt like we wanted to build something that would let people use Bitcoin for what it was designed to, to be used as and uh, as, a, as a payment system. And we wanted to, um, uh, you know, deliver something that was of, of real substantive value to businesses, not not just a, a vehicle for people to speculate and trade. And, uh, and so that's how we settled on the idea for BitPay, which is very, a very simple idea. Let's just build, um, an API that a company can talk to and accept a Bitcoin payment just, and, and make that API work as, as similarly as possible to the way they're used to working with the credit card system and, uh, sort of like an adapter for them. And, uh, and then let's get really high quality businesses on our platform, learn from them and then iterate and, and improve the platform. And that actually was the business model in 2011. It's still the business model today. Um, uh, but that's, that's kind of how we got to a point of what kind of business we wanted to start. So then, uh, we started building the platform, I guess, May of 2011. We launched it shortly after July 4th of, uh, uh, 2011. We had it ready to go before the July 4th weekend, but we felt like uh, we wanted to enjoy the the holiday before we got started. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, we launched it. Um, and in those days, we were happy to get five or 10 transactions a day. Um, 
And, uh, and, you know, Tony and I also, we, in those early days, we didn't actually sell Bitcoins on the exchanges. What we did was we just came up with an agreement that he and I would each buy 50% of all the Bitcoins that came in, uh, from the business. And, um, and, uh, that worked out well until a little bit later, we signed up Butterfly Labs who had announced that they were coming out. I'm still out. waiting for my miners, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, they so th th that was an interesting story. So Butterfly Labs uh, was going to pre-sell ASICs. And so they just announced that they were coming out with a ASIC chips and they had already done FPGAs and and had some success with that. And and so they announced they were coming out with ASICs and they were going to pre-sell them. And uh, your the order in which you paid uh, was going to be the order in which those ASICs were shipped. Um, and they, and they also took wire transfers for payments. We weren't their only payment option. And they, uh, they decided to start selling on a Saturday. Now wire transfers don't work on a Saturday. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so what happened was they, they started selling and 100% of their order flow came to us. And, uh, and we had people buying, uh, buying those ASICs, uh, to get in line and, and be the first ones shipped. And so I remember that was on a, on a Saturday. I, I happened to be on vacation with a family in Florida. And all of a sudden we have like, we're seeing all these Bitcoins roll in and we're- How many Bitcoins do you remember? Uh, you know, I think at one point we had, uh, the wallet was up to like 25,000 Bitcoins. And okay, 25,000 Bitcoins. Yeah. At a, at what was the Bitcoin Gosh, price? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a few dollars. Yeah, I think it was like six or seven dollars at that point. So we had uh, all these Bitcoins rolling in. And at that point was when he and I decided, OK, we can no longer afford to buy 50 percent of the Bitcoins each. And so we're going to have to sell these on the exchanges. Um, wow. So you guys were just to go back to what you said earlier, you, you guys were were buying the Bitcoins from the company yes. for your own just personal stash That's instead right. of selling them on the exchange. That's right. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. And uh, it was a great way to dollar cost average, you know. So sure. um, and then uh, uh, so anyway, th uh, that day, I think our, our liabilities to Butterfly Labs were growing to like quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars. You know, it was uh, it was getting a little scary. And we were like wondering, are we going to be able to actually sell these things on the exchange? And well, how do you do that? I mean, at the time there was Mount Gox, it can't be X and a field of small ones. Yeah. But I mean, that's a significant well, amount of Bitcoin. It is. And it took us, a, you know, a week or two to, to clear all those uh, the sales. But, you know good for uh, a fortunate thing was that the price actually went up. And I think in those days, you know, d depending on what was going on, uh, how much activity was going on and what the price was doing, you know, we could almost stop selling Bitcoin for a given day and we would see the price of Bitcoin rise. And, uh, and so, uh, so we did manage that uh, and we, we sold the coins. And f a funny thing about it too, was that we, a lot of people that bought miners, they would then call us up and say, I want my Bitcoin. I want to buy my Bitcoin back from you on Monday when I can send a wire <laughs> transfer. So, so they were sending us Bitcoin to, to buy the, the ASIC um, and then on, uh, you know, uh, and then calling us up to buy their Bitcoin back that they just bought the ASIC with. Um, so anyway, that's insane. Yeah. And then the, st the story ended up becoming a crazy story and mm -hmm. you know, the, there aren't a lot of details about what happened, but um but I feel like a lot of the early Bitcoin companies, um, my company included, were just trying to figure it out as as we go. Like yeah. you, um, buy, you guys buying the Bitcoins and then having to go on an exchange. Mm -hmm. um, who else were some of your first merchants? Gosh, I think uh, one of the earliest ones was Bees Brothers out in Utah. Uh, oh, yeah. Bees Brothers. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that in yeah. six years. <laughs> And then later we got the alpaca socks. Uh, the alpaca socks yeah. from Matthew Wright. Uh, yeah, um, was it Matthew Wright? No, Ma Matthew was. I thought alpaca. Matthew was made fun of about the socks, but I'm not yeah. sure if he was the one that sold them. Well, there was somebody named Matt Wright. The reason I remember that name is he started uh, Bitcoin Magazine, um, and he was in Korea or something. I don't know if you remember. He put out that I weird Christmas Matt video. <laughs> Matt Wright is like a pariah. Um, he's probably going to listen to this and come after me, but he. I don't know what ended up happening to him, but I remember, yeah, he was based in Korea and he, he, um, disappeared years later. He ended up, what had happened was he made a bet with a bunch of people. Oh over yeah. Something. I remember that. Yeah. And I think the bet was that butterfly labs would deliver the miners or something, uh -huh. something to that. So I'm not sure if it was butterfly lab. It was someone, 
Um, maybe it was Neo and B. I think it was Neo and B that oh, okay. he that he he made a bet with a lot of people that something would happen and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so he owed a lot of Bitcoin. So he disappeared. Yeah. And this was like 2014. Yeah. But he so he was one of the founders of Bitcoin magazine, which mm -hmm. Vitalik wrote for. Yeah. And then ended up Vitalik. So back then, Vitalik was just this kid who was writing for Bitcoin magazine mm -hmm. who ended up going on to found Ethereum, which yeah. is which was crazy. Yeah. And then we bought the magazine, Tony and I and then a few other. Oh, yeah. I remember bought the magazine. Uh, it was about it was losing money and uh, it was a good sales tool for us to go into a company. And here was this physical magazine that you could read all about Bitcoin and what was going on. I bought the back cover from you. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we bought it and had it for a few years and then and then sold it to B BTC Media a number of years later when it, it kind of had served its purpose. Um, sure. It was never, never made any money, but um, it still is probably losing money. Uh, well, I don't know. You'd have to ask. Uh, you'd have <laughs> they to own ask a lot David. of media, yeah. um, a media companies in the space, which is good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, well, we sold them Bitcoin magazine and then but they continued to do why Bitcoin, which I always wondered why they did that because bitcoin magazine was such a great uh you know brand and uh why bitcoin was uh well i mean uh why why do why bitcoin when you can have bitcoin magazine and then uh but then they they've they've uh recently resurrected it so that's good when i was talking to mike caldwell um about this on on our episode a few weeks ago mm -hmm. but i was like you know mike when when you release the cassatius coin your physical the fact that I could physically hold, you know, this symbolic thing or this mm -hmm. Bitcoin in my hand was such a big deal for me because that was like a light bulb moment that this Bitcoin thing was really real. Yeah. And I had the same effect when I was able to go into a Barnes and Noble and actually buy Bitcoin magazine. Mm -hmm. And I'll say like, hey, mom and dad, look what I just bought. Like this Bitcoin thing mm -hmm. is not just this thing that I know about in your basement, but this is a real thing. Like we have our own magazine. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, my crazy. parents still thought I was crazy, but it didn't matter. Yeah, I thought those, I, you know, those cassatius coins were were uh, they were great, but I thought it was like sort of antithetical. Like we're supposed to be doing this all in in the virtual world, not in the physical world. And uh, and everybody was like, "Oh, I'm gonna these are gonna be worth a lot of money one day." And and I thought that's crazy. Uh, and sure enough, they were. <laughs> if, if if Mike hadn't been shut down by the government, like he was sent a FinCEN letter, uh -huh. I don't think the collector's value would be as high. Yeah. But and so that whole story of it is because he'll never be able to like remake anymore. Mm -hmm. And but when I asked him the same question, I was like, you know, isn't this kind of anti Bitcoin in a way? And he said, yeah. And actually, he was like, um, he didn't, he wasn't happy with the security of the coin mm -hmm. because people were trusting him with their private key when when you're buying the coin. Yeah. And when he came out with the coin, Bitcoin was only worth a few dollars, right? So yeah. it wasn't significant money. He did the coin in order to um, give the coins out to people at like Christmas and mm -hmm. gifts. It was mo meant to be that, yeah. like for them to have a taste. Yeah. It was never meant to be like a like a bear bar or like an actual um, yeah. um, tr transferring value. And he did go a little way with it. Like he he created these 1,000 Bitcoin gold bars, mm -hmm. um, but he only made a few of them. They weren't meant to, to, to actually do. Yeah. But then you had some like crazy merchants over the years. And I mean, I read an article in 2017 um, you guys were almost doing up to like a, a it was on your blog up to a billion dollars, which is such a crazy number mm -hmm. of, of volume to be doing yep. in like the year like 2017. Um, but then you had some crazy merchants. Like I remember when you got the, the D in Las Vegas and you had the yeah. Sacramento <laughs> Kings. Like why why the Sacramento Kings? You know, I, I don't I'm not as familiar with the, the how that happened, uh, how the <laughs> Kings came about. Um uh, but the D was great, uh, and the owner of the D was uh, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, very supportive of what we were trying to do, and um, and for for them it was a, it was a great way to draw in new customers, and uh, and yeah, we we would have uh, when we go out to Money Twenty Twenty in Las Vegas, we'd have a, an, an event at the D, and um, it was a great way to just showcase you know the possibilities, right? Um, and the Bitcoin Bowl was that way too, it, you know, the Bitcoin Bowl took a lot of our time and, and, uh, you know, kind of consumed us for a little while there, but it was very, a very interesting experiment in the sense that you had all these restaurants in, 
St. Petersburg that we went and signed up and you could go around the town and just, you know, use Bitcoin like it was a normal universally accepted currency and, and sort of experience what that was like. And it was, it was very cool. Back then. Um, and I want, I want you to try to tell me, uh, cause I know you're not as involved in having the merchants uh, come onto the, in, onto the system early mm -hmm. on. You, you were more, more so, but, at what point in time over the past 10 years did it go from where merchants would be actually excited to integrate Bitcoin because of the, you know, getting new customers, but also like they must have some of them must have gotten like that Bitcoin bug and actually like fall in love with this thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe now more and I could be totally wrong, but more so now I feel like it's just because it's a good business decision. Yeah. Um and that's what makes me most excited about it now is uh, people are actually using it. Companies are using it because they get real value out of it. And it's not because they want to, they're fans of the technology or they, they want to make a, a, a big uh, marketing headline. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say in the early days you had the enthusiast companies, the alpaca socks seller or the, the bees brothers type companies, the small mom and pops. And then somewhere along the way, um, one big, big, uh, notable merchant that we signed up was WordPress and uh, WordPress actually, interestingly enough, they, they signed up not because they wanted to make a marketing splash, but because they actually found real value in it. Um, they, they, at the time, and this was wordpress.com, the, the hosting site, they, they said that we, we can host WordPress here in the U S and we can uh, charge people money for, for it here in the U S and a few other geographies, but a large part of the world, we have no ability to collect a payment. And we also, because we want WordPress to grow, we're just giving it away for, you know, for free in those, those geographies. And, and what they found interesting in, in, in BitPay and Bitcoin was, uh, the fact that they can now reach all of these underserved markets and, um, and be able to have a payment system for them. Um, whereas before there was no option. And, and so that was, that was really cool and, and very, and that, and that was actually, that, kind of, that was actually a catalyst for, um, then Barry Silbert, uh, coming in and, and investing in our seed round. Why is that? Uh, I think uh, as soon as we had a, a, a household name like WordPress suddenly get interested in this payment method and it was for actual real value reasons and not not um, not because they were fans of the technology or whatnot, um, then all of a sudden this this became, you know, a real, you know, thing. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. A real in, uh, potential investment. There were very few investors back then. We had a lot of overlap in our investors mm -hmm. too. Uh, Barry Silber, uh, at Bit Instant was also an investor in, mm -hmm. um, uh, Roger Veer. Mm -hmm. Roger would just, I remember raising money. Roger was the easiest person to raise money from. Yeah. He called me on Skype one day and he said, sounds great. After five minutes, tell me where to send the money. Yeah. And that, and that was it. The paperwork came later. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Roger w introduced us to Barry, right? So who are some of the more controversial merchants that you um, had? Well, we already talked about uh, Butterfly Labs. You know, of course, we didn't know at the time that they would um, have a, have such difficulty getting those ASICs shipped. They did ship, but uh, a good bit later. Um, I don't know if it was a year or two years after they originally promised them. And then uh, uh, and then eventually they just had uh, and, and the quality of what they shipped was not not great. Um, you know, so, uh, and then they just had, yeah, they, they were pre-selling a lot of stuff and then not, not delivering. And, um, yeah, so that was one, um, other controversial, I'm trying to remember, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe you would remember some of, some of them better than I, I, I've started taking notes by the way, over the years and, and like, uh, um, people always ask me, what are the interesting stories and whatnot? Yeah. Tell I, me I, some I'm, stories. What, what do your notes say? Oh, I've got a ton of stuff on here. <laughs> stuff we won't, I mean, we, we'll only scratch the surface here in this call, I'm sure. But uh, um, gosh, looking through here. Uh, the well, other topic I, I want I wanted to ask you about, but we can do it after, was mm -hmm. um, you were very involved in the 2000 Bitcoin uh, hard fork. Yeah, um, the uh, story of that is, is, I feel like it's whitewashed. Like, we need to learn from our mistakes, but to yeah. ignore what happened um, today is not, really good idea mm -hmm. um so i want to get your take on that but um we could do that first or we could do that after yeah let's we can do that first okay cool so in 2013 
um bitcoin upgraded the, so there was only one like bitcoin software at the time that majority of people used and the following consensus and from what i remember and i'm not a you know i dabble i'm a script kitty right mm-hmm. but from what i remember we the bitcoin software was merging it was migrating to a new version of the to a new database something i forget we're going from level database to berkeley database yeah, and, level or, DB. Or, yeah, yeah okay and basically it caused consensus to go out of whack mm-hmm. so essentially people that had upgraded to version yeah. 0.8 were mining on a completely different chain mm-hmm. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, this was a hard fork. Yeah. An unintentional hard fork. Right. Uh, yeah, that's in my notes here, too. That was an exciting, interesting time. <laughs> I was at a bar mitzvah. Yeah. And I got the message. I had to, like, run home. Yeah, yeah. Like Superman. No, so I, this happened, and uh, all of a sudden, it was popping up on IRC. And so in those days, we used sort of Bitcoin talk, and and IRC was used a lot. And uh, Tony and I uh, were uh, actually awake and, and looking at this as it happened and, and uh, just watching IRC. I wasn't actually participating, you know, in the discussion, but just kind of watching, trying to figure out what, what the heck was going on. And as that was happening, the price of Bitcoin was plummeting, right? And so here we're trying to run this business and process payments and all this kind of stuff. And the, the price is just, just the bottom is like falling out of it. And um, and then the, and it was also, it was amazing to see all the people in IRC trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. And, uh, one amazing thing about it was in the period of maybe an hour to an hour and a half, uh, people had diagnosed what was wrong, figured out what the bug was, and then also <clears throat> reached a consensus about a path forward. And, uh, you know, some miners were going to lose money because they went off on, on one branch of that fork. But essentially what happened was the database was changed in, in, in Bitcoin and, that led to, you know, a, a, uh, some nodes, uh, accepting some blocks and other nodes like crashing and not accepting, uh, you know, during the validation period, uh, uh certain blocks. And that caused, uh, one version of the software to go off on one uh, branch and other version to go off on a, on a different branch. But as soon as they had diagnosed that problem, and so the prices we're watching the price, I'm on the phone with Tony watching IRC. And I said, they figured it out. Uh, this is not going to be that bad. And then we just started buying Bitcoin at that point at that bo- at that bottom. And uh, and and actually the price then started uh, rallying and re- recovering. Uh, but I also remember it because Barry uh, called us up and said, is this the end of Bitcoin? And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here you have an investor in BitPay and, and uh, you know, people kind of very seriously wondering, was that the the end of the experiment, you know? Well, that was great. Let's let's all pack it up and go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So exciting times. What other stories do you have in your notes? I'm curious now. Um, gosh. Uh, when Gavin met with the CIA. I don't know if you remember that one. That was um I remember when Gavin met with the CIA, he he had told everyone mm-hmm. um and that's around a lot of people blame that for why Satoshi left. Yeah, maybe. Uh I, I don't know. I don't know what it, what the exact timing that was there, but it was very shortly after, you know, I, I came into Bitcoin that Satoshi left. So it was like, I, I think the toward the end of 2010 or early 2011 was when he kind of disappeared, right? Mike Caldwell told me that he had missed Satoshi by one day. Oh, really? Like, if you look at when the last comment for Satoshi came uh-huh. and then when Mike joined the Bitcoin forums, it was literally 24 hours. Maybe he's Satoshi. <laughs> no, that's what I said to him. <laughs> He said, if, if I'm Satoshi, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the My Bitcoin hack. That was another big one. Uh, I need to have, uh, I actually emailed Bruce Wagner oh, to really? come on the show. Oh, wow. So I don't know. I can't, well, I, it hasn't been, um, I think, a lot of people think, or I shouldn't say I think, it's it's thought, okay, let's politically correct, it's believed that Bruce Wagner was behind the My Bitcoin hack. Mm-hmm. Um but who knows? You yeah. know, I'm not going to sit here and make accusations. So well, I'm trying to get him on the show. Yeah, my Bitcoin was like, I mean, even in those days, everybody was like, this is just a disaster about to happen. You know, it was like a, a, anybody who, you know, was uh, understood Bitcoin and how it worked is like, why would you ever put your Bitcoins on a website that, you know, you don't know who the who's running it and, and uh, this is crazy. And it's just, yeah, it was almost like, a, you know, a, a train wreck in, in slow motion kind of thing. Uh, we used to use uh, Insta Wallet for mm-hmm. uh, our poker games, and we, we were playing poker one day, and there was like ten Bitcoin in the pot, mm-hmm. 
And that's when Insta Wallet actually had that big hack too. Yeah. And so I forgot. I think it was like Eric Voorhees brother, little brother who won the pot. Yeah. And we're like, sorry, the Bitcoins are gone. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I'd, forgot, I, I'd forgotten about an Insta Wallet. By the way, Eric, uh, one, one, one story a lot of people may not know is that Eric uh, designed our first logo. So, oh, did he? Yeah. Wow. I think I knew that, but I hadn't remember. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I think we paid him 60 or $70 worth of Bitcoin, which is, who knows how many Bitcoin at that time, but uh, <laughs> 30 or 40 Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah. And, and we went with him, we met him in person for the first time at the 2011 uh, conference. So, uh, he had designed our logo, and uh, we kind of was that the New York Bruce Wagner conference. Yeah, it was. Yeah, who who else was at that conference? Well, uh, obviously uh, Gavin was. He had just joined. What was that company called? Uh, um, that's no longer. Oh, True True TrueCoin. TrueCoin. Yeah, TrueCoin. Yeah, he, that was the big sort of the big announcement that that he had joined them. Um, uh, let's see. There was. Uh, well, Jeff Garzik was there. I remember him him giving a, a presentation on uh, what Bitcoin was. Um, gosh, there was, uh, I, I mean, there were like 50 or 60 of us, right? It wasn't that big of yeah. a conference. Yeah. That was it. Mm -hmm. That was the first gathering in the yeah. history of, of Bitcoin. Of um, And then a few months, I met Bruce Wagner a few months later yeah. at um, his office and I was on his TV show mm -hmm. or his, his, uh, his new show. Yeah, we went on that, and then, that show. Yeah. Uh, what was that network he was trying to create? Was, Only one TV. It was a, or something? one one TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, I wonder where he is today. Yeah. I didn't meant this to be like a turn into a nostalgia nostalgia episode, but that's crazy. Um yeah. so tell me more about how how BitPay eventually evolved. I mean, um you probably have dozens of how many staff do you have now? Uh about eighty five or so. Wow. Yeah. And uh still in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Headquartered in Atlanta, we have an office in Amsterdam and also one in Argentina, uh, and then a few sales folks that are scattered around. I feel like a lot of people like worked or did work for BitPay at one point in the course of history. Yeah, um, um, it, it's pretty cool to see a lot of former BitPay em employees out there either starting companies or you know um, having notable roles at other companies. Mo Levine worked for you for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eric did some work for you in the logo. Um, was Roger involved at any point? Roger never worked for BitPay. Uh, but he helped out? Yeah, yeah. He was very helpful in, in a lot of different uh, ways over the years. You know, put us in touch with Barry in the in the early days when we did our seed round. You know, and one of the things we did right was, uh, you know, I this is my fourth startup. So um, it wasn't like I was new to, to startup companies and uh, second one as a co-founder. And so... Uh, we did a lot of the right things in the early formation of BitPay that made it an, an investable company. And we felt like, I, I felt like the technology and, 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 and what it could do um, was at, at sufficient um, potential that, you know, it was very likely that the VC world would get interested in this space uh, in time. You know, so now you're, you're still talking 2011. It's like a very early very early on right and and at that time silicon valley and uh all the vcs out there had had no interest and didn't know what bitcoin was never heard of it and uh but i felt like at some point they would and and, and when they started wanting to make investments if we were not an investable company then some other company would be and a competitor would be and we would be um yeah we would we would be um you know in trouble and so we had to make sure that we were, uh, from the very early formation of BitPay, an investable company, and ready to take that investment when when it when it came. And sure enough, uh, obviously the venture venture world, uh, uh, you know, came in and, and started making investments. And and at, in the in the time, I think it was late, maybe early 2013 um, or late 2012, when uh, they really got interested in the space. Um, you could probably count on one hand the companies that were investable. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things that we did right in the early, early day, early days of BitPay. I guess that's what, um, that's what it's not excited me, but that's what, um, threw me off a little bit because here we are, we're, we're a bunch of like, um, kids in the, in the sense of the word that we were, you know, immature, mm -hmm. um, anarchists or libertarians or whatever, and here you come along and you and Tony are like the adults in the room. Yeah. Um, the ones who 
will be taken seriously. And um, and your company like lasted. I mean, it's still la- it's so long. Uh, it's it's insane. Do you ever you got to think about that? Saying to yourself like, "Wow, like we we are the oldest, longest running like operational uh, Bitcoin company." Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you must have it. You have to have a ten year event. Yeah, we, like, we, I'll we fly to Atlanta yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, we, we we definitely will. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think um, you know for me. You mentioned the libertarian, the, the anarchist. Um, for me, Bitcoin was never, you know, I, I, I sometimes describe myself as an apolitical person. For me, it was the technology and and what it could do, the potential there that it had. I was never, I, I was never a big fan of the the politics side of of Bitcoin. For me, that represented a threat almost to Bitcoin. Um, you take, you know, something that's going to be controversial in in and of itself, and uh, mix it with other controversial stuff, and that's just going to give people excuses or reasons to shut it down. And so, um, all the Silk Road stuff that, that was going on that to me, that, that was, uh, a danger for Bitcoin and, uh, you know, a big risk. And, and, uh, I, I would have liked to see the community just really focus on what Bitcoin can do and not bring all these other political agendas in, into the mix. Um, yeah. You're right. You know, you're right. And so there are two types of people that that got involved in those years. They were the ones that were excited about the technology. Mm-hmm. And then there were the libertarian um, anarchist types. Mm-hmm. Then there was me. And I don't really, I didn't fit into either. I'm not a computer mm-hmm. science. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. And I was never a, a libertarian. In fact, Eric and Roger used to make fun of me that I was a statist. <laughs> um, because, I, well, I didn't know that I, I never, loved I the government. Knew, I never knew this about you, uh, Charlie. <laughs> well, I didn't. I I never came. I came from a a conservative, uh, religious Jewish background. Mm-hmm. Like we are all about the government. You know, mm-hmm. my parents are voted or like we'd have family outings to go vote. I would uh-huh. be. I remember going to the voting booth since I was uh, uh, ten years old. <laughs> um, going with my parents. You know, mm-hmm. very into that. And so this whole Bitcoin world. And I and I think back sometimes and I ask myself, like, why did I get involved in 2011? Mm-hmm. Like, what was it about this space? And I guess for me, and this is what my therapist says, mm-hmm. he, I, he says, I need to do something that no one else is doing in order to be different. Mm-hmm. Because um, that sense of individuality is so important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I got involved by mistake. But then I asked myself, like, what's the future? Mm-hmm. Um, I talked to a lot of the early Bitcoiners on the show and just privately guys like Jared Kenna. Mm-hmm. Um Jared get Jared's burnt out. Like he's just not involved in crypto anymore. Yeah. Um, I like Jared. He got burnt. I, I, I was always. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Lives so close here down in. Um, uh, I don't I actually can't say where he lives. He lives in Alaska, actually. I thought he was Never still. Mind. I mean, last I knew he was in Columbia. He's in Columbia. No one knows where he is. I can't <laughs> say where he lives. He doesn't want me to say. But um, he's burnt out. Mm-hmm. Um, he just doesn't want to. Um. And I understand. Well, I mean, I, look, I mean, look at all he went through with Trade Hill and the second iteration of Trade Hill. I mean, it's tough. He so actually, um, the, so the episode came out a few a few months ago, uh, two months ago. But last week, and I just spoke to him last week because last week he won a a, a legal battle mm-hmm. because what happened was um, when Trade Hill got shut down, he returned everyone's money. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were people that came back years later saying, "Oh, you owe me this money." So someone brought a lawsuit this year. Wow. Like five years later, saying that Jared owes him like two thousand Bitcoin, but the guy couldn't substantiate it. Mm-hmm. Like there was no proof, but this guy had a lot of money to, I like, guess, you know, I I don't know the details of the battle, but jo- Jared won because the judge was saying that you can't. That's not a good, you know, you can't come back five years later saying, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. this guy owes me the money, but I can't prove it. Yeah, but that's what he went through, so he's burned out, and I don't blame him. I, I feel that sometimes mm-hmm. um, there were periods that I. Didn't know if I was going to stay in the space or what I was going to do. You ever get those feelings? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are many, many times where BitPay almost uh, ceased to exist. <laughs> There's and the scaling, yeah. the whole scaling debate, you must have just been so frustrated. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was interesting because, and, and kind of stupid on my part, I, I should have seen what was going to, going to happen there. Uh, you know, at, at the time, we felt like the community's about to fracture, it's about to split. And, uh, you know, maybe we could be helpful to get these miners who are refusing to deploy SegWit uh, and get them to, you know, 
give a little ground and get some of the developers who did, weren't interested in a, in a hard fork and, and a block size increase, kind of get them on the same page. And maybe we could be helpful in working something out and we could all stay together for at least a little while longer. And, and of course, we stepped right into the middle of a, you know, big uh, war effectively. And uh, um, in hindsight, we should have just stayed, you know, you know, miles quiet. away. From but it was that, hard to yeah. stay quiet. Everyone said something back then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that scaling debate was so crazy. I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the future of the space? Where do you see yourself? Do you see BitPay still around in 10 years? Oh, gosh, I hope so. Um, you know, I have fun coming to work every day and I, I really still enjoy what we do here. I think we got a great team of people that, that I get to work with. It's sometimes I say it's like, you know, having a Bitcoin meetup every every day here, here in the office. And uh, um, I'm excited. Uh, you know, we've uh, uh, I think there are as I look forward, what I've come to appreciate is that really this is a new kind of database. If you look at the Bitcoin database, you look at all the other blockchains that are out there. It's a new type of database. Uh, each of these databases has this native token that uh, incentivizes the security of that database. Uh, when I look at Bitcoin specifically, I see the most secure of those databases. And uh, there are a lot of applications even beyond payments for them, uh, which is probably more than anything what makes me sort of bullish on Bitcoin itself. Um, and then uh, I think there are, we, we need to figure out how to apply these databases to other use cases beyond money and payments. And I think you can look at any kind of centralized database, take a, a Facebook, a Twitter, a GitHub, and I think they're eventually going to be replaced by blockchains of some kind. Now, we've got a lot, lot to figure out about the security model of those blockchains and, and, and whatnot, but uh, I think it's a matter of time. And there's, there's tons of opportunity um, for investment, for, uh, you know, new, uh, new disrupt disruptive, uh, applications of this technology. So it's, it's a fun space to be in and, uh, enjoy it. I enjoy it. I'm really excited for the future. Mm -hmm. Steve, how can, um, people follow you on, uh, Twitter and, and follow what you're going, what you're going on and what's going on with you and what's going on with the company? Yeah. Well, they can follow BitPay's Twitter. I don't tweet very much, uh, anymore. It's <laughs> smart of you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at, at some point I, w I was kind of active on social media. I was never really active, but, uh, you know, it, and, uh, posting a few things, uh, thoughts on, on medium and whatnot. I don't, I don't do too much of that myself anymore. Uh, mainly because I was just wasting time with it. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, BitPay has, a, a, you know, our BitPay Twitter, uh, that you can follow and, and stay up to date, uh, you know, as, as far as what we're doing. Excellent. Steven, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I really appreciate it and I can't wait to release the episode. All right. Thanks, Charlie. And, uh, it was great, great to talk to you again. And let me know about a 10 year event. We will. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening. This episode of untold stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of crypto mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at cryptomining.tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.